All right, so my name is Acacia. Um, I, I have been working with the mushroom since I was a teenager, and Baba Kalindi is one of my friends and teachers in the work. And I am just really grateful to be able to stand here before you guys today and um, just share a little bit of how I came to get into this work. So um, when I first started working with mushrooms, I could tell that I was a little bit different than some of the people who had you know, brought me into the mushroom scene um, in Houston, Texas. I started working with the mushroom pretty early, you know, uh, being a teenager, working with mushrooms, and also coming from an academic scene, uh, what was a little bit opposite of uh, the population in Houston that was working with the mushrooms for party purposes or rave purposes, go see some pretty colors and have a good time. I started working with the mushroom because I had depression. And the mushroom, I found out much later on, had so many more uses other than just healing depression. And so... When I first started working with the mushroom, it was because I had been a suicidal youth, and um, some folks who were really amazing decided that they were going to share some mushrooms with me. And shortly thereafter, I had my first trip. My first trip was a seven gram trip, and that trip was with Penelius Hawaiiensis. And Pan Cyan or Pan Hawaii are a bit stronger than psilocybin mushrooms, which I didn't know at the time. I didn't know how to check the potency or whatever. And um, needless to say, I had probably one of the best trips of my life. But where Kalindi really came into um, the picture for me was when I realized that some of my trip reports did not sound like any of my peers. I had been seeing temples rise out of the ground that were made of etheric light. I had experiences where I looked at people's faces and I saw different lines and patterns that looked like geometry. And I wanted to know more, but nobody had been talking about it. Until one day, my boyfriend, whose name was Osiris, at the time, shared with me a video from Baba Kalindi E. And that's how I officially started uh, studying Baba Kalindi's work, was when I watched one of his YouTube videos. And I will never forget the fact that my first instinct was, how is it that someone could take that many mushrooms? Because I knew that 15 grams or 20 grams was a lot of mushrooms. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to go find out. And so I started on a quest to go up from seven grams to 21 grams. That took me several years. So um, fast forward a couple years, I was in the desert one night and I finally made it to my first 16 gram journey. And I was living in Rodeo, New Mexico, uh, 90 miles from the nearest town, off grid. And I had some mushrooms I had driven to Texas to go get, brought them all the way back and it was my birthday. This was like, maybe seven years ago, yeah, seven years ago. And when I had that, that journey, I took 16 grams of mushrooms and a little bit of Syrian rue, it wasn't very much. And I had this trip where my floor fell out of my house and there was this giant Buddhist Neo underneath my house. And I got sucked into this vortex that was a Sierpinski triangle. If you've ever had a graphing calculator, you see the fractal triangles, triangles within triangles, and it takes you deeper into like this labyrinth. And I got sucked into a molecular state, a quantum state, to the point that when I came out, I could see the particles coming out of my mouth. When I held my phone, the light was frozen in place like it was a hologram. And I could see like all the particles inside my hand. It was almost like my hand was translucent or transparent, kind of. And so, you know, I had shakily grabbed my phone. I was still tripping really hard. And I remember the first number that I saw on my phone was Kalindi's number. I had his name saved uh, in my phone because he had posted his, his, his phone number uh, in response to a message I had sent him previously. It's like, call me, I, I'm traveling, and call me at this number. So I called him, and I guess it was like 3 in the morning. I wasn't paying attention to time, and he answers the phone. And I'd say, well, I haven't heard you talk about this yet, and I've been following your work. Sorry, my name's Acacia. I'm kind of rambling. And he said, call me when you come down. <laughs> and that's how we started talking, is me inappropriately calling him at unearthly hours of the morning on a different dimension. So the thing that stood out to me about Baba Kalindi's work the most was how authentic he was about, and is, because he's still teaching in the multiverse, but how authentic 
his teachings were. Like, if I listened to a lecture, I remember I got into the habit of when he first started doing blog talk radio programs. If you look at blog talk radio, you'll find a lot of topics that he didn't necessarily lecture about on YouTube. Uh, which are primarily about different technologies, you know, talking about the Meta Nedger, talking about the Tree of Life, talking about crystals, talking about Yi Ming Zhu. There's all these different uh, lectures and podcasts where you know, he might be featured with another speaker. So I'd, I'd make sure that I'd call in, because back then I would just call in. I didn't know how to <laughs> well, work, the, work the little app, and I'd call in, I'd listen in to his lectures at like uh, Friday nights at 6 p.m. and be on Brother Honk's show. And I'd listen, and I'd be there with my boyfriend, with my partners, and we'd be sitting there and be like, you want to go in? Like, yeah, let's go in. So we'd take like 10 grams, and we might have this lecture going on in the background. And I was always struck by the fact that whenever he'd say something, like he, he might be talking about uh, the, the Middle East or the Sufic uh, priesthood or, or you know, sub-Saharan African mushroom use, I could see what he was saying. I could literally, legitimately explore what he was saying. And so it got me thinking, OK, if this isn't real, then I can't research it and make the same conclusions. So immediately I started backtracing as much as I possibly could what he would talk about. And personally, it, 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 was, it was a passion of mine because when he first started talking about Acacia on YouTube, I really got curious about Acacia DMT. I actually had my first Acacia DMT and Syrian Root trip two days ago. <laughs> And I'm still coming down from that trip as I speak to you now. This is how long this has been in motion. But when he'd talk about certain things, instead of saying, OK, well, is this guy just sharing random information, he was sharing things that really impacted his development and growth in the psychedelic world. And I really appreciated that firsthand experience and that firsthand knowledge of recognizing how to stand in your power, not just standing in your power for the sake of saying it feels good or for an ego trip, but the fact that there are certain trips that you'll have at high dose where you really do need to stand in your power, where you really do need to know some martial arts and movements to move the energy around, to be able to express and, and to travel. So my, my, my biggest passion coming from a research-heavy background, I went to school for astrophysics and was shoved into the mushroom reality. And so almost everything I brought into the mushroom was centered around physics, quantum science, and biology. And I wanted to know how consciousness and science could work together. And that's what the mushroom helped me to start figuring out is, OK, what am I? What am I made up of? OK, now I know that I'm made up of particles. And these particles are intelligent. So when he talked about uh, Krishna and, and going up on 20 grams and seeing somebody who looked blue, I said, OK, I'm going to have that trip. So I set a date, and I said, I'm going in this weekend. I called him. I said, I'm going in this weekend, Baba. He said, OK, you're going in first Saturday? I'm like, I'm going in first Saturday. He's like, I might go in, too. It's like, OK. And I go in. And I didn't encounter the blue guy, but I did encounter a lion-headed being that was shooting fire out of its mouth, sitting in a lotus pose with six arms. I didn't have the vocabulary to describe what I was experiencing in my trips early on. So I did a lot of Googling. I was like, lion-headed man, six arms. I was like, this looked like some kind of Indian stuff. Like, I've seen this like, on, a, on, a, on a wall painting somewhere. And I found, oh, that's Lord Narasimha. OK, so I met Lord Narasimha last night. OK, that's cool. You know, and it, it, it made me want to do more research. It made me want to explore more. You know, Baba Kalindi's work was such a wealth of history is such a wealth of history and is such a wealth of uh, anthropological knowledge that is connected to the way that we work with entheogens. My biggest, my biggest passion when I, when I would listen uh, to other people talk about the mushroom is like, well, why aren't they talking about you know, the knowledge of the ancients, the technologies of the ancients? OK, so there's smoke computers. OK, so there's crystal computers. Why is nobody really talking about it? And I realize it's because if you don't take the dose, if you don't go in at like 15 to 20 grams, these things will still remain ordinary. Sure, you can talk to a tree, but you may not necessarily be able to go and tap into the tree's um, mystical technologies or, or sit at the foot of the tree and be able to uh, connect with the medical benefits of its fruit and hear the stories of how it got its name, et cetera. There are certain dosages that unlock certain capabilities within your environment. So uh, Kalindi made 
what I thought was so weird and strange, he, he made it make sense in such a way that nobody else could. Nobody else was talking about it because nobody else was doing that kind of dose. And so as I progressed in my dosages, I made it a point to, okay, I go in, I call the Bible clinic and say, okay, so this happened in my trip. He said, okay, well, take more. And I'd, I'd ask a bunch of questions and I, and I wouldn't get an answer. And so finally I did take more. I go in 21 grams and then finally I might get an answer like, uh, have you ever heard of the Emerald Tablets? And I'd be like, no. He was like, okay, well, go find out, take more. Go look up the Emerald Tablets. He'd be like, okay, so can you write me an essay that's like a page long about what you experienced? I'd be like, all right. And he'd write me back. That was the thrice greatest uh, essay that I've read. And I had to follow like this breadcrumb trail that would lead me closer and closer and closer to finding esoteric history that was linked to the mushroom, that was linked to crystal technologies, that was linked to uh, information. You know, he wasn't walking around saying, I have the secrets to the universe, but he's definitely helped us to find and uncover things that are extraordinarily, uh, like, like you can't get it from anywhere else but knowledge of self, you know, and you can't get it from any other experience than knowing thyself inside the experience. And so it's a constant walk, it's a constant practice, you know. So I just want to just give thanks for his wealth of knowledge because the research hasn't stopped. That, that inspired in me personally um, the love of research again when I was doing lots of research in astrophysics and geophysics and really disenchanted with the fact that there was no communication between conscious research or religious studies and science I even asked my university, can I do a research um, engaged learning project? I'm a McNair scholar, I'm a Hamilton scholar. I was a, a, one of the youngest dual credit students to ever go to college you know, and, and be in high school and college at the same time and where I'm from. I asked them, I was like, hey, can we just do a research study together? Study uh, vibrational physics, you know, quantum physics, but on a vibrational and consciousness level. And they said flat out, no, we're not ready for that. And through listening to Baba Kalindi's work, it helped me to realize that I didn't need them to do it for me. I could do it myself, and I could do it on my own terms, and I could go in, find the answers that I'm looking for by connecting to the mushroom and connecting to my own experiences and share that with others and have them explore it for themselves. They don't have to take my word for it. They can just explore exactly what I saw for themselves on their own terms and make the same realizations, hopefully if, they, if they're going to go in that deep. So ultimately, the transdimensional crystals um, of Baba Kalindi is where I really got interested in actually going in a high dose consistently. Because it seemed like every trip I'd take, I'd go a different place, and it would be nonlinear. So I would have to try and stitch together all of these piecemeal experiences, and I couldn't really get any momentum when I first started going in at high dose. I have this experience of dying and coming back, then, then I'd be resurrected into this uh, cat person. I remember one time I looked in the mirror, I saw I had fangs and a tail, and I called Kalindi on the way driving down, down the hill at home in the desert. And I was like, well, Baba, I looked in the mirror and I had fangs and a tail. I don't know what that means. He said, we need more warriors. <laughs> and he left it at that. <laughs> so... When, when it comes down to it, you know, he was, he was a really good friend and that he, he, he'd always make me smile some kind of way, even if it was just like two or three words. And when I did actually finally meet him in the flesh in 2018, it was right after he had started uh, sharing about transdimensional crystals. 2016 is when he first started really talking about it and putting it on his Facebook page and then also doing blog talks. And saying, you know, like, there's stone technology. There's iPhones and laptops of the ancients. And I was like, you know, I come from a tech-heavy background. If this is a thing, now I'm going to find out if it's a thing because I love my iPhones and I love my technology. And so I bought a transdimensional crystal. It was like 60 bucks. And I was so mad at the time because, you know, you get a, a quartz crystal for $2. I was like, I know I can go get some regular old quartz. Okay. Gigs up, there's a regular crystal in here. I was expecting it to be glowing or levitating or something. And it wasn't, so he was like, just go in. So I remember it took me maybe five or six trips 
And I just kept going in at it. I put it on my third eye, nothing would happen. I'd shake it up, nothing would happen. Stare at it real hard in the dark, couldn't see it. So finally, I got the right combination of variables together, which was, for me, low light, like having a Himalayan salt lamp, and uh, being able to hold the crystal at a specific angle so that light entered the crystal, because I had been studying, OK, well, what happens when light enters a stone? You can take a cat's eye uh, crystal, and the speed of light will slow down to 60 miles an hour inside that stone as it passes through. So when light enters these quartz crystals, it can amplify or slow down the frequency of energy that's entering these stones. And to put it uh, in, I guess, layman's terms, have you ever seen like a Vogel crystal? They'll show energy entering the stone in like a diagram, like uh, you'll, you'll see the, the protons, electrons, et cetera, go through the stone and they amplify as it refracts against that six-sided Burl geometry and it'll create another loop and amplify again. And we've seen Tons of videos about energy healing, chakra therapy, you go into any yoga studio, just like in Doctor Strange, where Doctor Strange goes and talks to the ancient one. He's like, I see this, you know, in gift shops. You know, I kind of felt like that a little bit. But when I took, uh, I think it was like 15 grams, just about, what I did differently was I looked into the stone and I started to speak to it using my mind. Thoughts do create reality, thoughts do create matter. But what's interesting about the crystals is that the stones themselves have a consciousness embedded inside of them. And I didn't make that connection. I listened to the lecture, but I didn't make the connection that the stone was actually sentient in and of itself. So when I take the mushroom, like let's say five grams, I couldn't connect with the voice of the stone. I didn't know the stone had a voice. But when you take 15 grams, you're staring at the stone, and you might ask it a question like, well, can, can I go somewhere? What am I supposed to do with you? And it would say, what's the password? I don't know what the password is to this stone. So, you know, listening to Bible's lecture, I'd play it, play it on repeat. I'd be on the drive home, I'd be at work listening to Bible's lecture. I'd be like, I still don't understand how these crystals are supposed to work like an iPhone. I'm trying to push the button. It's like, well, if you don't know where the button is, I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'll take more. And when I took more, what was interesting was when I was holding the stone, I had this immediate feeling as if I kept getting distracted. You ever have those trips where you can't sit still, where you can't see straight, where you keep fidgeting left and right? Yeah, you had those trips. Well, that was me in the multiverse, you know, before. <laughs> before this crystal really came and started working on me. When I, when I held the stone and I kept fidgeting, I said, you're distracted. And I was like, okay, well, what's distracting me? And ultimately, I kept seeing like these visions of, okay, there's my, my, basically my anger problem, there's my rage problem, there's my lack of forgiveness problem. Like, I'm not dealing with any of that. And I literally had to release it out of me. I had to let all of these pretend versions of Acacia go. Some people call them entities, some people call them programs, some people call them you know, spirits, whatever you want to call them. I had to let a lot go internally because it doesn't seem possible. I, I remember Baba Kalindi used to say, for instance, um, you got to leave all that mundane stuff behind. You have to leave your daddy problems and your mommy problems and your boyfriend problems. You can't take that into the higher realms. So I literally had to take only what I need into the crystal to be able to travel inside of the stone. And only what I need at that point was the observer. Learning to be the observer allowed me to be able to control my body, be able to control my thoughts. And that point of momentary now, not getting stuck in the past, what somebody did to me, you know, that narrative story that we have playing that you know, runs over our life, what happened in the past or what's gonna happen in the future. Just staying focused on the present, kind of like Baba Mudu said, it is the way that I was able to utilize the stones properly at high dose. I couldn't believe what happened when the stone finally opened up. It's as if what I knew about tripping went out the window because there were maps inside of the stone. He said there were maps inside of the stone that he programmed into them. And these maps were different locations in the multiverse and different star systems, places that you could travel to that maybe you would have had to wait till you got to 30 to 50 grams to be able to find the locations to. 
but I started traveling to different places. And these places had trees, waterfalls, you know, sand. That's like a completely different rainbow color. It's like rainbow glitter sand. You're sitting on the beach in this holographic uh, area being able to read books and go on vacation. And I didn't believe any of that was really real until I had the experience myself of being able to go somewhere and then control the filter, control the dimension, control the time and space in which I was in. And that's how the stone worked as an iPhone. It's like calling a number. You can dial a code, basically, energetically, by consciously connecting to the stone. And it's a technology that a lot of people say, OK, well, I, I want scientific proof. I want this. I want that. The ultimate truth is we don't have the scientific tools in this dimension to verify what's going on with the stone technology. The stone technology is so much further advanced than any tools that we have here that you're not going to get a computer analog answer because this is a bio-organic technology. This, this is a, a technology that has been used for over 250 million years. Since before humans even showed up in our record, this is not a, a human technology. And the mushroom will tell you that. If you got any questions, go take 20 grams and find out for yourself. But it's not just any old stone. Some of these stones have to be ancient. The stones that we're using are Lemurian stones, but Lemurian is just a, a, a term coined by David Geiger. He's the guy who decided that stones were going to be Lemurian. And stones are going to just be regular quartz, so they don't come from a specific place in Brazil or Colombia or Cuba, so they're, they can't be priced hundreds of thousands of dollars for a super clear quartz point. But the truth is, these Lemurian stones come from a different time period in the Earth's geologic cycle. 22% of the Earth's crust is made of quartz or silicon dioxide. That's what they use for computers. They use uh, it for hard drives, you know, store information, one terabyte of information can be stored on a piece of quartz uh, this, this small. And what's really interesting is that when you go down deeper into the Earth's crust, you can get to stones that are quartz that are almost 10 million years old. On average, about 4.8 million years old is how old these stones are. But when you get to that area where you find these stones that are really truly ancient, you find that these stones have personality characteristics unlike other stones. They have different etchings in them. They call it alligator quartz or fenster quartz. These are geological terms I studied in college. These are terms for stones that have etchings that look like alligator skin. Well, if you take mushrooms and stare at them, it might look like an ancient language. It might look like circuit board. You might see uh, different fibers connecting it to other parts of the stone that look almost biological, like, like fibers of muscle in the human body. And then when you take the mushroom with these stones, you may also see different animal effigies. You may see different faces, like a tiger or a lion. You know, the ancients would look for these stones that had these different markers, that had animal totems inside of them, that had uh, markings, like, like words inside of them, and then take mushrooms to be able to unlock what information they had inside. True record keepers, not the record keepers you go and look it up and pay $888.88 for it on Etsy. But these record keepers that the ancients kept in their, uh, in their medicine bags or in their pockets over thousands of years that were dropped, fell in the ocean, dug up by somebody else. These stones are very special. And so not every stone can be a transdimensional stone, but almost every stone is on some level because stones are devices that store energy. When we hold a stone, we're also programming it with information. That's what I realized when I would be working with the mushroom at high dose. And what Baba Kalindi made so extremely clear with the Transdimensional Crystal Project was that I didn't have to start skipping from trip to trip to trip. I could store the locations that I went to and revisit those locations and form a record. So that when I work on myself, it wouldn't be just boom, rebirth, back into this reality, ego, bullshit, done. It would be I can go in and go in again re-solidify myself, get stronger, take what I've learned from the last trip, apply it to the next trip, and it starts a snowball effect where you start to progress exponentially. And then that's when you start evolving from what you knew as being human before into someone who can do things in multiple dimensions without mushrooms. You can perceive other dimensions uh, of, of reality. Some of the things that we think aren't coming from our minds, some of the things that we think are coming from energy from other people. We know we have an electromagnetic field. 
So when you start working with the crystal technologies and you're able to empty your mind, you might be able to perceive other people's thoughts and see how that affects you, what you're pulling in, what you're pushing out, what is your frequency, what is your vibration. So after studying about the transdimensional crystals, I wrote several essays for Baba Kalindi, and he said, yep, yeah, those, are, those are really good. So when we have our camps, we're gonna talk about the transdimensional crystals. But what was even cooler is that about two years before he passed away, he started talking about the stone he called the Palantir. Have you ever seen Lord of the Rings? You've seen the Eye of Sauron, where he's got an eyeball in the middle of it, and Sauron can see where Frodo's at, and Frodo can feel him looking at him, and stuff like that? Well, he found this stone that was a Palantir stone, but there are multiple Palantirs. Even the Lord of the Rings, he said in his own video, he said not all the stones are accounted for. So you can still uh, find stones that are from this geological time period that contain this information, potentially. But what's interesting is that when you work with the transdimensional crystals at high dose, you can start a series of manifestations that'll keep your reality on a certain vibrational frequency axis. When the Palantir was turned on, the goal of the Palantir was to be the super server for that. So when someone goes in on the Palantir, it sends that vibrational frequency to everyone else's crystals. It programs the other transdimensional crystals that are quantumly entangled with that same pocket, that same mineral vein of conscious stones. And that this Palantir will also be able to uh, send information that was collected in the multiverse to other people's devices. So when I sat in front of the Palantir for the first time, I really didn't know what to expect. It's a giant stone. And it looks like a rock. It's sitting on a pedestal. It's very pretty. But I had no idea what to expect. Some of the last lectures that Baba Kalindi gave are on his Facebook page. If you type in the search box, Palantir, you're going to find several different lives that talk about the utilization of the Palantir as a higher level technology to be used to train oracles and seers of the future. And this technology was completely valid in that the transdimensional crystals worked on one level, being a very small handheld crystal, but a very large Palantir stone, you could harness a lot more information and a lot more energy into it and be able to travel inside of it, uh, uh, taking maybe multiple people with you or, or, or hundreds of people with you if you wanted to, you utilize it as a vehicle to travel within. And a lot of people think this stuff is, is all that woo-woo technology, but ultimately, um, if we look at how the ancients used stones, plants, animals, they learned from animals how to, how to, how to perform warfare because the, the animal uh, system or the animal DNA is also within the human. So we can shape shift into a jaguar or turn into a, to a, a, a werewolf or whatever. Uh, if, you're, if you're staring at the werewolf on mushrooms, you're absorbing information from its gait, how it runs, how it attacks, how it hunts its prey. So such did we use stones as computers and technology to store information, to travel into novel states of consciousness and to save the coordinates to those novel states of consciousness within stone technology. And Baba Kalindi brought that to regular people. Normally these stones would be kept in warehouses or, or as someone's crown jewels. You know, the Queen of England, the Hope Diamond is a Yiming Zoo stone. It glows, it's a glowing diamond. And what's interesting about it is that certain stones were only kept by elites. You know, you go into an antique shop, you find certain stones on the shelf. These stones were reserved or a state, uh, I guess you could say a state sold stones are very beautiful. But what you didn't know is that the estate owner was a 90 year old lady who was sitting there programming her dreams and her memories into the stone to pass down to her children. And here you are buying this beautiful estate jewel thinking, oh wow, it's just a pretty stone I'm gonna put on my shelf. You take 15 grams and the stone says, hey, what's up? And you're just left there staring at the stone like, did the stone just talk to me? No, I'm just on mushrooms. But the stone can. The stone, the stone can get your attention. And it's what's really interesting is you always know when you find one that's really special, it speaks to you. It speaks to you in frequency. You're like, this one feels right. When you put it on your forehead or you put it on a necklace, this one uh, makes me feel grounded. This one makes me feel energized. But that's only one level. That's only one layer of what the stone has to actually offer you. And when you start taking mushrooms at high dose, you start to explore the depth of information within that. 
What's interesting to me is that I met an Andean shaman um, who worked with sacred stones. He said, in our culture, we call them chanchas or wisdom keepers. What we do in our culture is we'll, we'll drink wachuma tea and send the priests down into the labyrinth. And then uh, after they get into the labyrinth, they find a stone. And this stone is a wisdom teacher. And they're taught to travel inside of the stone to pull back information for the whole culture. And these are things that are recognized in other countries. There are just human abilities. That, that there are wisdoms kept inside stone, just like you write on stone to preserve something. You literally write onto the stone, like a laser programming information, utilizing the windows of your consciousness to program light encoded information into these stones and write on it just like a hard drive or a hard disk. And a lot of people wanted to say, okay, well, I don't wanna take the dose and find out. I was the kind of person who not only took the dose to find out, but I integrated it as a technology to study other things. I didn't just want to use crystals so that I could travel and find out, okay, where's my family, where am I from? I wanted to use the crystal technology to verify the validity of certain plant medicines. I had issues like cancer. I had issues like uh, STDs. I wanted to find novel ways to cure myself and also access different super-powered herbs, novel and powerful uh, ethnobotanicals herbal medicines. And so I utilized the crystal technologies to guide me into the right direction to find out, okay, in the last age, what was used when you're zinc deficient, when you've lost your uh, sense of smell and taste? You know, we talk about Ant-Man, you know, and, and Wasp, but what people don't know is that ants were used by the last dynasty of China in, in, in the ancient Forbidden City as the highest bioavailable form of zinc, and they were fed to emperors, powdered ants containing the highest amount of zinc. And wasps, as honey, in the Yodotono Mixed Tech Codex, where the original mushroom priest took the mushroom uh, in the Aztec uh, time period, what they would eat with the mushroom was black stingless wasp honey. You know, and so a lot of these things that you see in TV shows, like this new movie called Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, these are things that were brought back from the multiverse. If you watch Ant-Man and Wasp, there's a reason why it's called Ant-Man and Wasp. If you take Melipona honey and put it into your eyes, which is stingless wasp honey or stingless bee honey, then you gain the ability to integrate that technology into your human vessel. So that when you're traveling into the multiverse, you're able to gain more speed and travel into honeycomb-like structures and organize your thoughts in such a way that it turns into like a beehive. You're able to utilize these plants as technologies. You want to travel to the infraparticle level? Well, chances are you're going to burn out by the time you get to the bottom because it's going to take so much energy for you to, honey, I shrunk the kids down to a molecular state that when you get out, you're going to be exhausted, waiting for the trip to end. But if you take ant extract, then you get to have the ant trip or the ant man trip. And these are all technologies that can help activate you on a higher level. So when we look at the cacophony of plant medicine, I've taken the crystal technology to be able to verify, okay, what's intellect tree seed? I, I want something that makes me smart. It's called intellect tree seed. I want something that I can use to articulate the cipher. What's cypress articulatus? It's Nile River papyrus. Not only did they use it for paper in the Nile River Peninsula and the Amazon rainforest, they utilized it to put into their baby's eyes so they could see the grid and the fabric of reality, so they could see beneath the floor, into the skin of other people, and to do surgery on them. When they look into their, the bodies of people who are sick, if, you, if, if you're in Silicon Valley and you go down to Peru, they always know, oh, there's surgeons down there, spiritual surgeons. If you have brain damage, we might be able to find you a spiritual surgeon who can fix your brain damage with ayahuasca. How do you think that the ayahuasqueros train to be able to do surgery on individuals. They use crystals and plants. They use the stones to send energy and to amplify the energy into the bodies of individuals, sometimes their own hands. You got crystals in your bones. Your bones are piezoelectric. But they also use plants so that they can see underneath the layer of the cipher, the plants called cypherus articulatus, literally articulating the cipher. When you take your entheogens with these crystals, things like that pop up to you. It just looks like giant red writing. It's, it's like, it's so obvious that you can't help but see that these things were named a certain way for a reason. 
that these things were placed in your domain for a reason. And what Kalindi did was share with us things that were placed in our domain, just like eating the mushroom at high dose, just like going in to the Meta Nedger and looking at uh, the different freezes to see the pharaohs holding mushrooms and eating mushrooms, and a journey into the underworld, and a, a sar being shaped like a mushroom. All of the symbolism, et cetera, is research material. The modern schools, et cetera, will say, oh, well, that's not research material, so we teach ourselves. We take the mushroom, we listen to lectures, and we go further and deeper. And if Kalindi hadn't opened any of those doors by sharing all of that information, there's absolutely no way that I would be able to speak in front of you, this full packed audience, and share this information with you. Go research your ants and research your stingless wasp honey and take more. And go find yourself a stone that's got an animal's face on it. Or that's 4.8 million years old because those stones were listening. 12.6 million years ago, when the Lemurians walked the earth or the Atlanteans walked the earth, there were technologies on this planet that make our civilization look really low tech. How do we know that? We hold the stone, we take the dose, and we go to these locations, and we look at their technologies, and we are able to bring some of that back. The more doctors, lawyers, mathematicians, and physicists that take a high dose of mushrooms, the closer we can get towards building a society where we can use consciousness as a state of technology, rather than debating as to whether it even exists. So yeah, thank you guys.